thanks for tuning into this week's Stacker Chat, your weekly update on all things Stacks. Stacks is smart contracts for Bitcoin, and I'm joined by Muni Bali, Stacks founder. Thanks for being here, Muni. Excited to dive in. So we have been seeing a few frequently asked questions, and I think that there's going to be more written material produced. But one of the things that has come up um, on Twitter and elsewhere is why does Stacks really need a gas token? Can you share more details there? Yes, I think this, this question uh, comes up a lot and I actually understand uh, why a lot of people ask this question because uh, in the Bitcoin community, I think there is a, uh, there's almost like a sense of like, you know, being truth seekers and really trying to see if a token is really needed uh, for a protocol or not, and I do think that uh, there's a lot of narrative that, uh, especially going back to the 2017 days, that most of these tokens are not needed, and, and so on. So I, I think when people ask that question, like I can understand like why they're why they're doing that. So let's let's dive in a little bit. I think uh, the simple answer is that you know um, you pay for gas using gas tokens, and that's kind of like the simplest way to execute a smart contract. Most kind of like modern smart contract systems be it Ethereum or like Solana, Algorand, Avalanche, any, any modern smart contract platform, you would notice that people are paying gas uh, to execute smart contracts. Like that's like, people are not gonna do computations for free for you, right? Like you have to pay them the fee in some way, but I think it's it's good to like dive a little bit deeper into the, the different design cho choices that, that you could have. So the first thing is that I think in the Bitcoin community, uh, there's a lot of talk about basically building peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, systems, right? So Bitcoin is a blockchain, right? So Bitcoin has a token, Bitcoin has global state, meaning that there is a, there's a, almost like a ledger of information that everyone on the planet can agree on and that information is globally available to everybody, right? And then uh, Bitcoiners usually understand like why Bitcoin, the, the token is needed to kind of like, you know, maintain the state of the blockchain and it, it is a Bitcoin sound money and so on. But most of the technologies around Bitcoin, if you notice, uh, because there's a version to, uh, to tokens, these are actually peer-to-peer -peer networks. So Lightning uh, is, is a type of a peer-to-peer -peer network. A bunch of people are coming together in a channel and then you settle the channel and the, and the state in the channel is kind of like destroyed. So Lightning doesn't have any global state, right? Just like on the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, there's global state at any point, any person uh, can find out you know, how much Bitcoin are uh, on, on a given address. That's global state, right? Lightning doesn't have global state, right? These are just channels, they disappear. Uh, and, and similarly, a bunch of other people are kind of like working in the Bitcoin ecosystem with approaches like DLCs, for example. Again, DLCs don't have global state. So these are like peer-to-peer -peer type of off-chain contracts. And, and, and you can do that, but you don't have global state, right? And, 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 and interestingly, um, there are some solutions in the Bitcoin ecosystem where people would start a federated network like Liquid, right? So Liquid is a, is a federation, uh, it's a closed network. You need to be kind of like, uh, be a whitelisted approved kind of like node operator to actually operate the network. And then if you're trusting the federation, then that federation can maintain a blockchain for you, right? So if you contrast the Liquid uh, network to Bitcoin, Bitcoin is a permissionless open network. And the reason it can be a permissionless open network is because of the token there, right? Token is the incentive. Token is the reason why miners are getting paid and they're kind of like maintaining and operating uh, the, the network. On, on, in the case of Liquid, uh, you're trusting a federation that whatever economic reasons the federation might have, they are, they are kind of like maintaining the state of the ledger, the, the global state. And for fully expressive smart contract systems, uh, you need global state. Like if you if you look at applications like Uniswap, you need to know like how much liquidity is in the system, right? So you can't build a automated market maker like Uniswap uh, through a peer to peer type of a design because you need you need a, a ledger, a global state for all the liquidity. Same for NFT marketplaces and so on. You need you need a global marketplace where anyone can list their NFT and anyone can come in and basically buy it instead of doing more peer-to-peer -peer, uh, type of trades, which, which are more limited, people can do that, but they're just much more limited than uh, what you get through kind of like fully expressive contracts on a, on a global state ledger. So then the, the difference really becomes the stacks is more 
uh, uh, follows the design of like what Bitcoin does that is open and permissionless. And, and there is a, uh, there's a token there, right? That is used to incentivize the miner that is used to pay the gas fees for executing smart contracts. So if you try to remove the token, you would either end up with a federation like liquid, which we think already exists, right? So people in the Bitcoin ecosystem uh, who, who don't mind trusting a federation, they can just go and use liquid, right? So that we are kind of like not adding any, anything new to the ecosystem if, if we start another federative network, right? So Stacks is a different design. Uh, it's more, more appealing to people who are basically like, hey, this is great that it's an open permissionless type of a system and I can use this new, new gas token uh, to execute smart contracts uh, for Bitcoin. Thank you. And so Stacks has native read access to Bitcoin and Stacks smart contract language Clarity can read and react to Bitcoin movements. Um, there's a lot of research and development in progress as well. But how do you distinguish between smart contracts for Bitcoin via Stacks and other smart contract systems that might be able to have um, like a Bitcoin state oracle? Yeah, so I think this, this idea comes up often that, hey, uh, you know, Ethereum could have like some sort of a Bitcoin Oracle. I, mean, I believe that uh, probably RSK has uh, something as well, where there's a smart contract that can act as a as as a as a Bitcoin Oracle. So there there are a few uh, technical differences here, but I think there are also differences in uh, how tightly we want Stacks to be integrated with Bitcoin, because this this idea of like being able to read Bitcoin state is just like one of several things that we do to truly like tightly integrate uh, the Bitcoin layer and, and the Stacks layer. So one of the benefits with, by doing that, uh, the, the, the way the Stacks has implemented is that all the Stacks full nodes are effectively, uh, like anyone who's running a Stacks full node uh, can get full visibility into the Bitcoin state as well. Like it's it's, it's, a, it's a little bit like you, you're, you're getting, um, you're, all of the smart contracts are getting that functionality natively by uh, by default kind of like built in yes i think there is uh, actually more clarity features that need to be built out but that's a programming language feature set type of issue as far as uh, the ability to read uh, bitcoin state is there that's like by default available everywhere and i think the the trust model is a little bit better as well instead of kind of like running uh, are running a separate article that can have like two different types of things. One is that the Stacks blockchain uh, automatically forks with Bitcoin forks, right? So if there is a Bitcoin fork, uh, Bitcoin is a source of truth for Stacks. And so the Stacks fork will basically just, uh, as a Stacks uh, chain would basically just follow the Bitcoin fork automatically. If you don't have that property in some other article systems, then you get into like some weird scenarios where uh, Bitcoin has forked but the blockchain that you're running on, be it Ethereum or, or some other blockchain, it, it has it basically runs independently of Bitcoin. So it, it is not aware of the Bitcoin fork. So it, it adds like uh, more complexity to running those systems than a very tight integration uh, that, that, that we have on, on, on the stack size. And as I said, like it's basically, so think of that as um, it, all the smart contracts get this by default. So you don't have to rely on some sort of a special Oracle or a special contract. Uh, and then you, you, you're not using an SPV type approach either. Uh, basically, uh, you know, full state is already available to you. So those are, those are kind of like some of the differences, but on a practical basis, I think this goes actually much more than that, right? Like, because some of these blockchains that are thinking of providing a Bitcoin Oracle as a side thought, right? They're never going to spend enough time and energy on the type of developer tooling and really tight integrations to enable uh, true kind of like, you know, Bitcoin uh, integrations. And I think stacks, like, so it's not just about kind of like the technical differences. I do think there is a difference of culture as well. Like if you really think of Bitcoin integrations as a first class citizen, then you're going to spend a lot of time on your developer tools. You're going to spend a lot of time uh, actually actually using these abilities and providing developers with the type of libraries and SDKs that they need to make it really easy and simple to actually use this functionality. And until you do that, it, 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 you know the basic functionality kind of like doesn't really matter. So I think a big way that Stacks differentiates is also the focus and the culture of tightly integrating with Bitcoin as much as possible. 
And this goes beyond just the read access. As I said, that's kind of like just one dimension. There's so many other things that are, that are, that are happening and interesting and unique in, in the Stacks ecosystem. Great, thank you. Now, there was a tweet um, by Zach Emanian, I think in response to something that you had said that, that really caught my attention. And basically there is this notion that there were you know, some good ideas for building on Bitcoin in the past, but that they shelved them because he didn't think that Bitcoiners would like degen into these protocols. And so I'm curious, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think for, for people who are not familiar with him, he's one of the uh, Cosmos founders and has done, done a bunch of work and in, in a lot of different protocols. And interestingly, I do think that people might have that image, but I don't think the data actually backs that up because um, if, you, if you look at surveys of people who hold Bitcoin, uh, we time and time again, we would see that people who hold Bitcoin actually hold other assets as well. And this was actually like a common thing uh, pre-2017 era where Bitcoiners would even publicly uh, kind, of, kind of like, you know, say things like, hey, I, I own like 70, 80, 90% Bitcoin and uh, I hold other assets as well. I think it's the, the post-2017 era where Bitcoin uh, maxi revolution has actually uh, in many ways, like, you know, uh, they're, they're policing uh, what people can say or, or do. So what ends up happening is that people do whatever they want to do privately. They just don't talk about it publicly. Like the amount of Bitcoiners that have privately told me that they hold, uh, you know, alternate assets. They have been trading kind of like other L1s. They've been trading other DeFi protocols. But on their public Twitter, they would never, ever mention anything like that. Right, so this is actually like fascinating because if you do, uh, there's a there's a little bit of a religious cult type uh, thing going on on the on the on the far side of Bitcoin maximalism, and people just don't want to deal with that headache. So so I think the actual holdings of Bitcoiners uh, it might be quite different from the popular narrative that you might hear on Twitter. And there are many data points to, to actually prove that as well. And I think I think the amount of interest that Stacks is getting itself is a data point, right? Like I think more than 30,000 people have registered their .bdc names. Uh, we are seeing people are deploying capital into new DeFi protocols. And that's that's Stacks is an ecosystem where it's the most natural for Bitcoiners to experiment with other things. But uh, just from my, my personal experience, knowing a lot of like OG Bitcoiners, uh, a lot of them already do this. And it's, I think the, the narrative might be very loud, but it's, it's, not, uh, it's not based in reality. Great, thank you. Now, I'm curious about, you know, you are interfacing with the Stacks ecosystem every day. What projects or news, what things are standing out uh, that are firing you up this week? Yeah, this is, this is amazing. I definitely think that our ecosystem has crossed some sort of a tipping point where uh, like you can't keep up with so many interesting things that, that are going on. And every now and then I'll see like some, some uh, amazing new thing come up. Uh, I think just a couple of days I saw that uh, Ellen Swap has made some more progress where you could do an end-to-end full swap between uh, non-custodial lightning and NFTs and, uh, and no kind of like, you know, STX uh, was involved explicitly in the entire trade, which is very interesting, right? So this, this, let me connect this back to the original discussion about, you know, why the Stacks gas token is needed. Uh, I think even some of the more, uh, you know, extreme maximalist uh, type uh, Bitcoiners, even they would say that, hey, uh, maybe a gas token is okay if it's quote unquote, like just in time. I think, I think uh, Adam Back um, had some, some uh, tweets like that as well, that maybe a gas token is okay if you just buy gas when you need it and then you just spend it, right? Uh, so, so Bitcoiners can view stacks uh, as that uh, if they want to, right? If anything, there can be uh, tooling available or wallets available that uh, basically make it easier for them to use the stacks network where it's just in time gas meaning that you can hold Bitcoin, you can, it will, to you, it will feel like you're paying the gas fees in Bitcoin. And at that point, it doesn't matter to you, right? Like you would have paid the gas fee on the, on the main uh, Bitcoin network where it's not scalable to do so, or you're basically paying the gas fee in BTC and in the background, it gets converted into something else and, and gets paid actually on the Stacks network. And, and that's the kind of experience that Alan Swap was, was doing as well, right? Like at some point, you know, uh, when you're interfacing and you're doing a swap on the Stacks chain, 
and a smart contract is being executed, sure, someone is paying the STX fee, but you don't see it, right? Like, and you don't have to explicitly go and acquire stacks or hold it if you don't want to, right? And I, I do think that uh, that lens is actually important for Bitcoiners where they tend to be very skeptical of new projects. And if you tell them that, look, you actually don't even need to hold STX to use the network. You can just hold the Bitcoin and pay the gas fee through your interface uh, in Bitcoin whenever you want to. They, they actually uh, then open up more to the, to the protocol and they want to learn more about it and so on. So I think, I think that that LN swap uh, was, was pretty interesting to see. And I think just uh, uh, this week, we have seen the Magic Bridge come up again on the same lines. It basically makes the UX really, really easy for Bitcoiners where all you need is a Bitcoin address. You send Bitcoin uh, to that address and magically the Bitcoin gets used in a application that's built on stacks. Right. So the magic bridge is kind of like uh, taking care of the underlying details of how it's getting swapped into XBDC or how it's actually getting deployed into some of the smart contracts. But from a UX perspective or as a Bitcoiner, you don't care about it. Right. So the magic bridge is another way of uh, doing this tight integration with Bitcoin and, and giving this, uh, uh, this experience to users where they just need to hold Bitcoin and, and, and can, can participate in so many different applications. And finally, I think I'm, I'm uh, obviously biased here because uh, uh, Zest is, uh, I'm involved from the trust machine side over there, uh, but, but Zest came out and this is, uh, this is a super, super interesting application where you're looking at enabling a lending market for Bitcoin. Uh, that people, the normal people can just lend their Bitcoin, not to a company like BlockFi, but they're doing it in a decentralized, uh, trustless manner. And I think, uh, so some of the details, I think I would highly encourage people to go and actually look at how the protocol is doing it or what direction it's going in right now. It's a very large market. And right now Zest is exploring like one particular kind of like sub uh, area of the, of the lending market. And I think the work that some of the people are doing is super interesting. Awesome, thank you. And we'll have resources down below, so definitely check those out. But thank you for tuning into Stacker Chats. Thanks, Mini, for being here. Um, please make sure that you like this video, subscribe, and let us know if you have any questions for future chats in the comments. We'll see you all next week. Thank you. Bye.